morning. Good morning. Just a worship note before we get started, and that is that during the liturgy, I will say, uh, at the time for communion, the body and blood of Christ given and shed for you. At that time, the uh, communion packet that you have, you just simply open it up and take both the host, the body of Christ, and the wine, the blood of Christ. And uh, so I've never done this before. It's new for me. And uh, I encourage you and, and just say uh, good luck with it. <laughs> If I see a few grape stains on your shirt, uh, I won't say anything. Also, I just want to mention that uh, uh, when I was driving down here, I was thinking about the outdoor service, and then all of a sudden that tune came to my head, rain, rain drops keep falling on. <laughs> Don't know where that came from, but we're going to, we're going to, be outside in spirit and in mind and in heart and uh, enjoy the fellowship with one another today. I'm delighted to be here and I would just invite you now to stand and we'll begin with the confession. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Almighty God, to whom all hearts are open, all desires known, and from whom no secrets are hid, cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit, that we may perfectly love you and worthily magnify your holy name, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Let us confess our sin in the presence of God and of one another. Gracious God, have mercy on us. We confess that we have turned from you and given ourselves into the power of sin. We are truly sorry and humbly repent. In your compassion, forgive us our sins, known and unknown, things we have done and things we have failed to do. Turn us again to you and uphold us by your spirit, so that we may live and see you in the newness of life, through Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. God, who is rich in mercy, loved us even when we were dead in sin, and made us alive together in Christ. By grace, you have been saved. In the name of Jesus Christ, your sins are forgiven. Almighty God, strengthen you, with power through the Holy Spirit, that Christ may live in your hearts through faith. Amen. Amen. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. And also with you. In peace, let us pray to the Lord. For the peace from above and for our salvation, let us pray to the Lord.
for the peace of the whole world, for the well-being of the church of God, and for the unity of all, let us pray to the Lord. For this holy house and for all who offer here their worship and praise, let us pray to the Lord. Help, save, comfort, and defend us, gracious Lord. This is the feast of victory for our God. Let us pray. Teach us, good Lord God, to serve you as you deserve, to give and not to count the cost, to fight and not to heed the wounds, to toil and not to seek rest, to labor and not to ask for reward, except that of knowing that we do your will through Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord, Amen. Please be seated. The first reading comes from Jeremiah. O Lord, you have enticed me, and I was enticed. You have overpowered me, and you have prevailed. I have become a laughingstock all day long. Everyone mocks me. For whenever I speak, I must cry out. I must shout, violence and destruction. The word of the Lord has become for me a reproach and a derision all day long. If I say I will not mention him or speak any more in his name, then within me there is something like a burning fire shut up in my bones. I am weary with withholding it in, and I cannot, for I hear many whispering. Terror is all around. Denounce him. Let us denounce him. All my close friends are watching for me to stumble. Perhaps he can't be enticed, and we can prevail against him and take our revenge on him. But the Lord is with me like a dread warrior. Therefore, my persecutors will stumble, and they will not prevail. They will be greatly shamed, for they will not succeed. Their eternal dishonor will not be forgotten. O Lord of hosts, you test the righteous. You see the heart and the mind. Let me see your retribution upon them. For to you I have committed my cause. Sing to the Lord, praise the Lord, for he has delivered the life of the needy from the hands of the evildoers. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Surely for your sake I have suffered reproach, and shame has covered my face. I have become a stranger to my own kindred, and have to my mother's children. Zeal for your house has eaten me up. 
the scorn of those who scorn you has fallen upon me. I humble myself with fasting, but that was turned to my reproach. I put on soft, soft sackcloth also, and became a byword among them. Those who said in the murmur against me, and the drunkards make songs about me. But as for me, this is my prayer to you. At the time you have said, O Lord, in your great mercy, O God, answer me with your unfailing help. Save me from the fire. Do not let me sink. Let me be rescued from those who hate me and out of the deep waters. Let not the torrent of waters wash over me. Neither let the deep swallow me up. Do not let the pit shut its mouth upon me. Answer me, O Lord, for your love is kind, and your great compassion turn to me. Hide not your face from your servant. Be swift and answer me, for I am in distress. Draw near to me and redeem me, because of my enemies deliver me. Should we continue in sin in order that grace may abound? By no means. How can we who died to sin go on living in it? Do you not know that all of us who have been baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death? Therefore we have been buried with him by baptism into death, so that just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, so we too might walk in newness of life. For if we have been united with him in a death like his, we will certainly be united with him in a resurrection like his. We know that our old self was crucified with him so that the body of sin might be destroyed and we might no longer be enslaved to sin. For whoever has died is free from sin. But if we have died with Christ, we believe that we will also live with him. We know that Christ, being raised from the dead, will never die again. Death no longer has dominion over him. The death he died, he died to sin once for all. But the life he lives, he lives to God. So you also must consider yourselves dead to sin and alive to God in Christ Jesus. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. The Holy Gospel according to St. Matthew, the 10th chapter. Glory to you, Lord. Jesus said to the 12, A disciple is not above the teacher, nor a slave above the master. It is enough for the disciple to be like the teacher, and the slave like the master. If they have called the master of the house Beelzebul, how much more will they malign those of his household? So have no fear of them, for nothing is covered up that will not be uncovered, and nothing secret that will not become known. What I say to you in the dark, tell it in the light, and what you hear whispered, proclaim from the housetops. Do not fear those who kill the body but cannot kill the soul. Rather, fear him who can destroy both soul and body in hell. Are not two sparrows sold for, one, for a penny? Yet not one of them will fall to the ground apart from your father. And even the hairs of your head will be counted. So do not be afraid. You are of more value than many sparrows. Everyone, therefore, who acknowledges me before others, I also will acknowledge before my Father in heaven. But whoever denies me before others, I also will deny before my Father in heaven. Do not think that I have come to bring peace to the earth. I have not come to bring peace, but a sword. For I, 
for I have come to set a man against his father, and a daughter against her mother, and a daughter-in-law against her mother-in-law, and one's foes will be members of one's own household. Whoever loses father or mother more than me is not worthy of me, and whoever loves son or daughter more than me is not worthy of me, and whoever does not take up the cross and follow me is not worthy of me. Those who find their life will lose it, and those who lose their life for my sake will find it. The Gospel of the Lord. Grace and peace to you from our strong God. Amen. Serious words. Hard words. Jesus is giving a realistic assessment of what the life of a Christian is. There was a book written many years ago called Are My Pews Too Comfortable? And it really wasn't about the pews. It was about the faith. Jesus is pointing out that there's a grittiness to being a disciple that it requires something that comes from God but works within us, and that it is not an easy task, but many difficult days. Just look at Jeremiah. He was a prophet. Now, if you ever see help wanted sign and then read in the fine print, we want you to be a prophet, I suggest you run for your life. It was a difficult calling from God because Jeremiah spoke truth to power. And whenever someone speaks truth to power, you better buckle up because you're in for a rough ride. And that was the task of a prophet to tell the truth about what he or she saw to tell the truth about how it was and is, not how somebody wants it to be or would hope it would be or would make up a kind of reality that doesn't exist. Being a prophet was not something you signed up for. It was something you were called to. And Jeremiah really didn't like his job. He mourned it. He said, it's so built up inside of me, pent up inside of me, that if I could, I would shed that identity and do something else. But he said, I can't stop myself from speaking the truth, the truth about how life was in those days and in many ways, still is today. So that was Jeremiah's take on what it meant to be faithful to God, to speak the truth. And sometimes that truth has to go and be presented to people in power. Prophets were often killed. They were often hunted. They were often banished. Their families threatened. No one wanted to hear their message, particularly the kings and the queens and the political leaders, because it usually meant a pretty harsh word in the way they were leading and directing the people. Ah, uh, Jeremiah, we're fortunate to have had a prophet like that. And everyone would agree except perhaps Jeremiah. But Jesus picks up that same theme, if you will, in today's gospel lesson. That theme 
that recalls that being a Christian is sometimes discouraging. A theme that says that being a Christian always means carrying your cross. Now I think there needs to be a bigger conversation, one that can't be fulfilled in a sermon, but a bigger conversation of what it means to be a Christian. We hear a lot about that in our day's world. And sometimes we hear, well, to be a Christian means that you're conservative. And others say, to be a Christian means to be liberal. I want to point out that those words are foreign to the Christian church. We don't talk in terms of conservative or liberal. And the reason we don't talk in those terms is because those are political terms, not Christian terms. Christians talk about being faithful, faithful to Christ's mission. And so these constructs, are you a conservative, are you a liberal, and the debate goes on and on. In fact, if any of you uh, had the experience I had last Thanksgiving, it was terrifying. On the one hand, I have relatives who claim to be very conservative. And then on the other hand, there are relatives that claim to be liberal. And when you're sitting at a table and they engage in a political discussion and you're just trying to get the gravy passed, <laughs> it can be a really uncomfortable position. And then especially when they look at the preacher in the family and they say, now, who are you about here? Could I have the cranberry sauce, please? <laughs> Those terms are not church terms, not, not churchly terms. They're political terms. And I guess they have their place in political discourse, but I'm going to suggest to you something else. The Christian position is to speak the truth as we understand it, based on the gospel, and to be faithful, even when it costs us something. And I can promise you, if you go out and speak the truth about the gospel, and not a truth that you come up with in your own head or that I come up with in my head, but a truth that is based on the apostolic church, a truth that is passed down for centuries, a truth that is articulated as a corporate body, as the body of Christ. That's why the church often at its annual assemblies write position papers on a variety of topics. And these position papers very seldom reach the hands of the people sitting in the pew. Although for some, it can when they're interested. But for many, it's, it escapes them. But the discernment of those position papers are important. And it's important because it isn't just Mike Dixon's opinion of what the gospel is saying. Or it's not just St. Paul's thought about the gospel. It is the body of Christ filled with faithful men and women, filled with people who are theologians and biblical scholars and sociologists and psychologists. And they put all this stuff and much more. And by well, the way, these position papers are voted on. The more majority of people that vote on them are people like you, lay people not with fancy uh, degrees or educations, but rather people who have a lot of learning through living, a lot of experience. But almost at the center of all these documents, it goes to the heart of what the Christian faith, in my humble view, is love. I had an interesting discussion once with a parishioner when we were talking about 
truth. And they were saying there's nothing more important than truth. Nothing more important. Always speak the truth. Let the chips fall where they may. But the truth is what's the most important. It reminded me of a story that Dietrich Bonhoeffer, a Lutheran theologian from Germany, told in his book called Ethics. He talked about a little second grader who was in class, and the little girl was just as cute as could be, but people that knew this girl, other teachers and people in the community, knew she was having a rough life her father was a drunk. And often she witnessed her mother getting beat up by her drunk father. And so this teacher comes into the room, introduces herself, and the kids are all introducing themselves. And then the teacher looks at the little girl, and she says, oh, Elizabeth, aren't you the little girl whose daddy beats their mother? That was the truth. But Elizabeth was horrified, embarrassed, didn't know what to say. And so after stammering around for a while, she looked at the teacher and she said, no, no, that's not me. Now, Dietrich Bonhoeffer asks a question. Did that girl commit a sin because she lied? She didn't tell the truth. And then he went on to write about a 50-page treatise on this. But I'll summarize it by just saying his conclusion was, no, she didn't sin. The person that sinned was the person that put her in an awkward, awful position. You see, the truth is important, but in the Christian faith, what's even more important is love. Truth tempered by love. Truth that is presented with love. It doesn't mean that you're lying. It doesn't mean you're not telling the truth. It doesn't mean that you don't have a valid point of view and that people don't have a right to speak their mind. It just means people don't have a right to be cruel in speaking their minds. And so at the very heart of the gospel is this thought that in all that we do and say, it's tempered by love. That's, that's what Jesus was about. Sinners of all kind came to Jesus and he would forgive them their sins. He would restore them to health. He would restore them to being part of the community. People knew that they had done something wrong. But they also knew that Jesus loved them. And if Jesus can love someone, then who are we not to? I had a seminary professor who used to say, be careful about drawing lines between people. You know, lines like, I'm a good person, that person's not so good. Or the line that says, I'm really smart, they're not so smart. Or the line that says, I'm really beautiful, they're not so beautiful. Lines that we make all the time, judgment lines. Judgment lines that said, I am worthy, and they are not. He said, be careful on those lines. Because he said, whenever you draw a line, you can believe that Jesus is on the other side of it. Jesus is with those who have experienced the judgment the cruelty and the harshness of the world. Now, now here's, here's where it gets tricky. 
You and I are, who are called to carry our cross, you and I who are called to love. When you start loving certain people and you make that known, it's like touching an electrical wire for some others. How can you love that person? How can you care for that person? They're a terrible human being. They're undeserving. If you're for them, how can you be, be for me? That's what Jesus is getting at. And when he says that when you go out into the world, our mission as disciples is to love others. It's, it sounds nice. Love? Who doesn't like love? Raise your hand if you don't like love. Except love is tough. And it's hard. And that's why we come to church. It's a boot camp, if you will. A training place. It's a place that gives us grit in our soul so that we can stand in front of a crowd and publicly proclaim we love someone that others are rejecting. That we can go in front of others, friends even, people we love and who love us, and say, no, I think you're wrong on that one. That person is a child of God, and I don't want to hear the gossip, the bitter words that you're uttering against them. That's not easy to do. I know, I try every day. And I can tell you it's not. But that's why, in the midst of this hard, kind of uh, difficult passage, in the midst of re reading about Jeremiah the prophet, Jesus talks about the sparrows right in the middle of this. Now, if we were outside, like we were going to be, I was going to have you look around and see how many of you could find a sparrow. <laughs> they're really not a flashy bird. They're brown. They're little. I, don't, I can't even imitate the sound they make. Won't try. <laughs> but they seem to be plentiful. And Jesus says, look at these sparrows. Now, you could buy sparrows in Jesus' day for a sacrifice, for two for a penny. That's not very much money, but they weren't considered worth very much either. Very simple, plain kind of bird. But he says, look at these sparrows that are flying around. He said, God knows each one of those sparrows. Something that others take for granted, don't, don't see as very valuable, that don't even pay attention to, God pays attention to them. Look at all the people around here. He knows the number of hairs on your head. Now, looking out, I see some have more than others. <laughs> For some of us, you know, God doesn't have much counting to do. <laughs> but he knows the number of hairs on your head. Who knows that? But God keeps his eye on the sparrow. And he surely will keep his eye on you. He'll keep his eye on you when you're out there proclaiming the gospel in the way that you think you know how, that you do know how. And it may be doing nothing more than sitting beside someone who is ostracized from the community. He's got your eye on the sparrow. When your family turns against that black sheep in the family, and is disgusted with their behavior or things that they have said when you extend a hand of love to them, even if you can't change them. God will keep 
your eye on those callings that we have as Christians to reach out to those who are milked and built and bled, who are poor, who are seen as not worth very much. God keeps his eye on you when you do that. And you can do it without feeling ashamed. You can do it without being discouraged because that's our calling. That's what it means to me to be a Christian, to speak the truth in love to power. There's a famous song that was written many years ago that probably many of us have heard. And uh, it goes something like this. Why should I feel discouraged? Why should the shadow come? Why should my heart be lonely and long for heaven and home? When Jesus is my portion, my constant friend is he. His eye is on the sparrow, and I know he watches me. His eye is on the sparrow, and he know, I know he watches me. I sing because I'm happy, I sing because I'm free, for his eye is on the sparrow, and I know he watches me. When you're out and about, loving in Christ's name those who need that love, feeling alone in that ministry, Remember, God's eye is on the sparrow, and his eye is on you as well. Amen. Let us confess, confess the faith of the church. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, God's only Son, our Lord, who went conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day, he rose again. He ascended into heaven. He is seated at the right hand of the Father, and he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sin, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. The Lord be with you. And also with you. 
Let us pray. Today, on this day of creation, we give you thanks for the rain that is gently falling around us. Please bless our farmers and those who work with all of creation into using the gifts you give us in nature so that we all may benefit as a community. Lord, in your mercy. Today we pray for those who are in war. We pray for those whose lives have been turned upside down by violence, fleeing for their life, wondering where their next meal comes from, hoping for a reprieve, desiring that the ones they love that are involved in the conflict might return home unscathed. Be with them. Lord, in your mercy. We pray for all those in our streets, in our cities, who go hungry each and every day. Bless the many hands that work at soup kitchens throughout poor, rural, and urban areas. This day especially we lift up St. Luke's Lutheran Church in Times Square in Manhattan, who daily feed hundreds through their volunteer efforts. They are acting as the church, help the greater church, help support their efforts. Lord, in your mercy. We pray who are, for those who are not with us today, who are ill, who maybe have fallen and been injured, who are transitioning into a safer environment, we pray for those who have sincerely wondered how long they have yet on this earth. Remind them of the resurrection and the hope and the healing that comes from you through your son, Jesus Christ. Lord, in your mercy. Today we also pray for this congregation, St. Paul's time of transition, a time of wondering about the future, a time of discernment on how to proceed forward. May the people know here in this place that you are with them and that with you, you will guide them and lead them and encourage them to be the church. Lord, in your mercy. All these things, Lord, we pray in your son's name, Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Please be seated.
Let us pray. Gracious Father, we give you thanks for this offering. May it be used for the mission of your church and for the benefit of all humankind. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. The Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. Holy, holy, holy Lord, Lord God of power and might, heaven and earth are full of your glory. Hosanna in the highest. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. In the night in which he was betrayed, our Lord Jesus gave thanks, broke it and gave thanks, saying, take and eat. This is my body given for you. Do this for the remembrance of me. And again after supper, he took the cup, gave thanks and drank it and gave it to all the disciples saying, take and drink, this is my blood shed for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Lord, remembers your kingdom and teach us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us and lead us in temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. The body and blood of Christ given and shed for you. Amen. body and blood of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, strengthen you and keep you in his grace. Amen. Let us pray. We give you thanks, Almighty God, that you have refreshed us through the healing power of this gift of life. In your mercy, strengthen us through this gift, in faith toward you, and in fervent love toward one another. For the sake of Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Before I uh, pronounce the benediction, I just want to add a personal note that I have enjoyed my time. I've gotten to know you uh, a little bit, and I find you uh, really delightful people. Uh, I, I have a lot of affectionate feelings towards you, and I wish you the greatest uh, uh, endeavor as you seek to find uh, a new pastor. Maybe you have one, or maybe you don't. I'm not sure. And as you uh, enjoy the rest of your summer, uh, I'm not going to tell you what I'm going to do because you'd be jealous. <laughs> <laughs> but I have deeply enjoyed my time in this community. And now, let's prepare for the benediction. <clears throat>
Almighty God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, bless you now and forever. Amen. We want to thank you for viewing our Sunday service. We have delayed video coverage on YouTube on our channel St. Paul NR. There are a lot of older videos of our church family on the YouTube channel. Check out our Facebook page at St. Paul NR. If you want to join us in person, we are located in North Robinson, Ohio. Our Sunday service starts at 9 a.m. The address is 2307 Main Street, which is State Route 602. 
We are six and a half miles from Galleon, Ohio and seven miles from Bucyrus, Ohio. Thank you again for joining us and we hopefully will see you again.